Well, today, whether you're here in person with us or you're watching online, we're really excited to be in week number two of a messenger series that we're calling The Journey is the Destination. It's based off of a book from the same title written by a guy named Jeremy Brown, and we're really pleased tonight to be able to have Jeremy with us. But before we bring him out on stage, I wanted to give you just a quick introduction to Jeremy Brown. He's somebody that I've known going all the way back to 2004, where we began working together in a little town over in Ohio, just about an hour from Fort Wayne. But Jeremy and his wife, Sheila, are originally from here in Northwest Indiana. They spent a lot of time in Dyer and our paths crossed at that church. And ever since we've been really close friends. And one of the things that Jeremy, or I'm sorry, that Jamie just told us that I think is really true is when you partner with a church like Suncrest um, and we are really into planting churches Jeremy and I are both the beneficiaries of the generosity that the people here at Suncrest have given over the years because just down the road in little Jackson, Tennessee is a church where hundreds and hundreds of people have gotten to hear the message of Jesus. And we've seen hundreds of lives change, hundreds of baptisms, all because the generosity of a church like Suncrest who invested in our little church there in Jackson. And we've seen what a difference that can make. So there's still time even today, if you wanna to continue to partner with us here at Suncrest, make sure and take advantage of that because it really does make a difference. So Jeremy's about to join us. I just want to say he's one of my closest friends in the whole wide world, someone I've been privileged to do ministry with for almost 20 years. So would you please help me give a warm sum Chris welcome to my dear friend, Jeremy Brown. So nothing's more awkward than having a guy introduce you. Have you ever thought of that? Uh, only slightly less awkward than wearing one of these and feeling like you should say, would you like fries with that? All the time. So, hey, I'm glad you're here because um, if you weren't here, I'd be here by myself and that would be even more awkward. And I just got to tell you, um, I went to Aruba a couple of weeks ago. Okay, so my wife and I got a chance to go to Aruba. Um, we were at a pastor's conference. I know suffering for the gospel, right, in, uh, in Aruba. And um, while I was in Aruba, I got a chance to play golf. Now, I like to play golf, um, but golf in Aruba is terrible. So if you ever go to Aruba, don't take your golf clubs because it's not fun. It's in the middle of the ocean. So there's like 50 mile an hour wind. They call it a breeze all the time. And it's not like that. Now, I'm not a golfer that um, that knows how to golf. You know, like I, I'm a, like my deal is I tee it up high and let it fly. I just hit it as hard as I can. So my golf game, my personality and my sense of humor are almost exactly the same blunt force trauma. Okay. So I'm just like, here's the deal. If you don't laugh and if you don't participate, if you don't smile and look like you're into this, the jokes, the lines get worse and worse as it goes on. So let's join me. So now if you don't know me yet, um, that is a good, there's a good excuse for that. Cause I'm not from here now. I'm originally from, um, from Hobart area, I, you know, Maryville. When I was growing up, we called it Maryville, unincorporated Ross Township. I grew up by the mall um, in back back in the day, right? So um, this area is my home, but we've spent the last um, 20 something years away from here. Like Bryce said, we partnered in ministry in, uh, in Northwest Ohio. And then about, about 15 or 16 years ago, my church planting story began right here with John Wassum, um, right here in Northwest Indiana, what used to be the Paragon restaurant. And John and I sitting across the table from us and John saying, listen, the best church planters I know are student ministry pastors. And they, and they know how to run things, they know how to get it done. And they have that kind of like, it doesn't matter what the obstacles are, kind of overcome it. And he spoke that into my life. And Suncrest has believed in us, believed in Sheila and I um, for more than a decade now. And we're thrilled to be a part of it. So if you have no idea what I'm talking about, right? You're going, who are you? I'm, I'm, I'm not Greg. Um, you may know that but I'm not Greg. I'm the one person on the planet who has less hair than Greg does. I'm just saying like it does happen occasionally. But here's the thing um, that you need to know. If you're here tonight 
And this is your first time like at Suncrest or maybe you're trying out church and you heard like, you mean I can go to church on Thursday night and I don't have to go on Sunday. This is awesome. Or maybe you've got a lake place, right? That's most of the people here tonight, right? You got a lake place and you're heading out of town and you don't know what's going on. And you're like, what is this guy? I want you to know something about this group of people. Cause I'm sure you've got questions. I mean, I was in the, you know, I was in the uh, lobby watching you enjoy the the meatballs, and I've got questions about you too. So, but but here's the thing though: like, if you've got questions about this group of people, I want you to know something. This is not a group of people that used to be people like you, and we're not a group of people who just tolerate or put up with people like you, and we're not a group of people who who are about trying to fix or change people like you. This is a group of people just like you. People, every person in this room has parts of their story that they wish they could do over. Parts that I wish I could edit, right? Or parts of my story that I wish I could go back and draw a box around and delete and forget they ever happened. Here's another thing that I want you to know about every single person in this room. No matter our drive, no matter our organization, no matter our status in life, every single person in this room gets stuff out of order. Like we get priorities out of whack and we don't always get them back into whack once we recognize that they're out of whack because that's how our life is. And I think that this whole idea of being like walking with God, the idea of church, Jesus, God, faith, the whole thing can kind of get this point to it where you go, well, I kind of did all that stuff. And now I kind of feel like maybe it's kind of fading in me. Maybe you've been going to church a little while and you're at that place in your life and you're, you're kind of feeling that tug in you and you're going, I don't, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. And what most Christians do when they don't feel like they're really growing, you know what they do? Switch churches. That's the norm, right? It's the, it's the reason why we have this like rotating door inside and outside of churches because people go, well, I don't know, I'm just kind of run into this stagnant part of my faith and I'm just not being fed, pastor. And I gotta be honest with you, if you're only eating once a week, you're gonna starve. And it's not the person who stands on this platform's fault. It's our relationship with Jesus. It's our relationship with God that is missing something substantial. And that is what's really going on behind that hunger. That's what's really going on behind that complacency that's going on in your life. See, I think there are um, a five at least gears. And I put them, they look a little bit like this one right here. And like, you know how gears work. I mean, they're meshed together. Even if you're not a motorhead, even if you're not really into this whole idea, the idea, these gears work together to perform a function. And here's what I know about these gears. And what happens in gears is the same thing that happens in our walk with God. It happens in our life. If we don't pay attention to all of them, they grind to a halt. But we outline in the book and the idea of this series and the whole thing that we're exploring together is that these gears have really names if you think about them. They look like this. I mean, I believe that if you would pursue God, you'd pursue authenticity, identity, truth, and relationships in equal parts. I promise you that it will yield the full life that you're looking for. The full life that that Jesus promised when he said in John 10, 10, that I came so that you might have life and have it to the full. I I came so that you could have life and have it abundantly. I gotta be honest with you. When I sit in chairs at churches, like even when I sit in my own church and I'm like, look, if this is only gonna happen for one hour every seven days, this is not the full life that I've been promised. I feel like I've been sold a bill of goods, but here's the problem. Most of us at some point or another developed maybe one, or two, or maybe even three of these gears. Maybe we pursued the idea of truth and we love to proclaim stuff. We're, we're kind of information people and we love this is important. You got to stand on this. And you know, that kind of like it yields country songs. You don't know, stand for something. I fall for everything, right? And you love truth, but maybe relationships are missing from your life. This whole like godly iron sharpens iron thing. Or maybe there's this part of you that comes into church and you're a little bit like my church growing up. Our church had magic concrete. I don't know if your church has magic concrete. I haven't been here long enough to know. But my parents, like growing up, they would fight all the way to church, right? Like cats and dogs yelling at each other. We'd be all kind of, every kind of tense. But the second their feet hit the floor at church, right? All of a sudden, hey, brother, it's good to see you. You know, like they'd just be really happy people all of a sudden. And what was missing from a lot of lives, not just my parents, my parents are great people, but what was missing from a lot of lives in and around church is authenticity. People who are being real with themselves and honest about their own brokenness. And here's the problem. When our relationship with God centers on one or two 
and these other ones get squeaky or rust or grind to a halt, the whole machine stops. And the reason that you feel that kind of complacent kind of dip out in your life where you're like, I don't know, maybe it's time for a new church. Maybe it's time for a new devotional book, right? Maybe it's time for a new, a new, you know, favorite preacher online, or maybe it's time for this is because one or more, or maybe all of those gears have kind of ground to a halt in our life. See, I grew up in what I call a believe and behave church, okay? My job was a little bit like this. It looked a little bit like this. My job was to believe some information back here, right? I'm supposed to raise my hand, walk an aisle, get into some water, do something and believe the right information that God loves me, that I'm a sinner, and that, that he gave his life for me, and that if I would raise my hand, walk an aisle, get in some water, that I would have believed all the information. And my job was to cross the line of faith. And then somewhere out there, like, you know, like the song, somewhere, I'm not gonna sing, way out there, right? Jesus is gonna come back and eternity is gonna start. In the meantime, my job is to behave. My job is to mind my manners and do my best, Try to do the good things. Don't do the bad things, right? And if you do the bad things, make sure you don't tell anybody, right? Like, or if you do tell somebody, make sure you make act like you're really, really sorry for it. My job was to believe and behave. And then one day I would get to go to heaven. All of Christianity was boiled down for me. Maybe it was for you. Like this, that Christianity, the idea of faith was about the minimum entry requirements to get my heaven card punched one day. Now listen, I don't want you to misunderstand something because belief in who Jesus is, is pivotal, right? Belief in the fact that God created us for a relationship with him. Belief in the fact that I'm a sinner. Not, I don't even wanna talk about you, me. But to be honest with you, in 30 years of ministry, I've never once had to convince somebody they're a sinner, right? Anybody a sinner, right? Everybody's like, yeah, I got that. I'm good with that one, right? We don't need to talk about that, right? <laughs> and then my belief that God loved me so much that he gave his son, that he would give his life for mine, that's pivotal. Belief that he's coming back one day matters. I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not saying that belief doesn't matter. What I'm saying is behavior matters, but behavior isn't the goal. Us doing the right things and not doing the wrong things has minimized the whole faith idea down to this minimum entry requirements that one day I would get to go to heaven if somehow I got the right answer. And that's kind of the problem in the church. And it's the reason why so many people will walk in and go, I don't know, your faith is so thin. It's so plastic and cheap. Your faith is so like only on the surface. And that's the reason why people reject it over and over and over again, because they're not seeing what is the real heart behind the kingdom of God is God coming alive in us, changing us from the inside out and making us the kind of people who behave. It's really, I think, it looks a little bit more like this. What God imagined for us was not believe and behave, but instead believe, so important, and then partner with God, partner with God's work inside of us to become the kind of person who behaves on, on accident. It becomes a part of who we are and behavior becomes the result of our life with Jesus instead of the thing we do to make sure that we stay in line and stay accepted at church and that right people look at us the right way. And here's the other key, is that eternity is not somewhere out there somewhere. When I die or Jesus comes back, eternity begins now. I love the way John Ortberg said it, that eternity is now in session. And in scripture talks about this stuff over and over and over again. In fact, there's countless pictures of it because we have a tendency to get our lives completely out of whack, don't we? We get our lives completely out of order. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of think of it like this. That's a lot. You know, it's kind of like this, you know, like we go, okay, listen, I, I've got this, um, you know, I've got these kids I got to get somewhere. I got to get this house. I got to get fixed. And then, oh, don't forget about the car doesn't run it. And then we try to get all this stuff. And what God's telling us is that there's a better plan that you're trying to push behavior. You're trying to push all the things in order. What God really wants for us is that he's saying, listen, this whole faith journey about believe this information and then become the kind of person who's faithful, become the kind of person who behaves is about seeking something that's so much bigger than religion. I want you to know something. I really honestly, I mean, I planted a church for Crown Island, so there's not a lot of people who have more skin in the game than I do in this room. Right, I, I've spent the last 30 years of 50 plus 70 hours a week, right? Every single week, pouring my life into the body of Christ. I believe in this place. 
But I want you to know something. Religion, stand up, sit down, spiritual calisthenics, it's empty. It's empty and it will never, ever deliver to you the, the, the come alive inside kind of life that Jesus wants for us. When, when Jesus said that, he said that I came to give you full life. Right? I came to give you life that can't be stolen, life that overflows and abundant right before that. He said something that's so important. He said the enemy, our enemy, Satan, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came so that you could have life and have it to the full. I think this idea is what is stealing and killing and destroying the gospel. Somehow we've minimized it to this list of information. You got to raise your hand, walk an aisle or get into some water. And that's all that you got to do and then wait for eternity to show up. But God has so much more for you. And the life of becoming is the full life. It's the life of purpose and value and mission. It's the life of meaning and, and fullness that God imagined for us. And I love the way Matthew talks about it. And like, it's, it's Matthew's gospel. It's Jesus talking. It's the most famous sermon of all time. And I love the way he says that Matthew 6, 25, he says this. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Not, uh, it is, not, is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? This, we're, this stuff up here messes with me though. Like this idea of do not worry. Because what Jesus is asking of us in this, like, in this little piece is for us to resign of the one thing, the one job that we are uniquely qualified and the one thing that we are epically, like we, we are the absolute expert on, worrying about our life. Jesus is saying, listen, it, I want you to know something. If you want the full life, if you want everything that I want for you, you're gonna have to choose to not worry about the life that you've got. I mean, I love this list, what you eat or drink or what your body, about what you'll wear. It's not, that, is not life more important than food or the body more important than clothes. You know what he's not saying? He's not saying that what you wear isn't important. I mean, I mean, like around here, our dress code is please do, right? Like just wear some clothes, it doesn't matter. But he's not saying that, 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 uh, that dress or the way you dress or what you dress in isn't important. He's not saying that don't eat. He's not saying those things are evil. He's saying what's most important is that you choose to not worry about those things, but place me first. You're gonna find out real quick in this talk, when Jesus is talking here, what he's saying is that if you'll put this first, it matters. Look at what he says. He says, he gives us an example. He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you much more important than they are, right? I mean, he says, aren't you much more valuable than they? Can any one of you be worrying by worrying at a single hour to your life. Can we just be honest? I mean, we know that, right? We know this information, that worrying is not really going to add anything. It's not really going to change anything, but we're so well-grained at it, right? We're so immersed in this idea of control of our lives that we are being stolen from. It's being kidnapped from us. Our idea of a real and full life is being stolen or destroyed or killed. Do you see who's doing that? You see, the enemy has this plan for our lives, for our lives to steal and kill and destroy all of our joy. You know, when we can't experience joy is when we're worrying. But God's saying, listen, what he says to us is in this full life, in the pursuit of who I am, get this idea that your full life is available to you when you choose to prioritize it. Look at what he says next. And, what do you, and, and why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. You, you, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like even one of these. Do you see what we're getting at? There's this transfer of trust that has to happen if we're really gonna develop this part of our life. If we're gonna really fully engage in this story that God wants for us. If you want the full life that God promises us, there's a transfer of trust. Worry, it always is the result of me trusting me. Now I gotta be honest with you. I mean, I have the opposite of the Midas touch. Pretty much everything I touch turns to crap, like real quick. So, so like the idea of me trusting me doesn't make any sense, right? The idea that I would, I would be in control, I'm going, wait a minute, when things fall apart, I'm usually to blame. Why is it that I wanna trust me? So let me ask you this question. How's it working out for you? Like if you're really kind of figured it out and you've got it all dialed in, you're worrying about it all the time, how's it working out? Is your worrying helping? 
I mean, is, is really engaging and trusting yourself wor- working? Or is it possible that someone has stolen or killed or destroyed something and traded you this idea of you worrying and you being in charge when really what he's stolen from you is the life, the full and abundant life that God promises us? See, there's so much more to this. He says this about the grass. He said, if God, if God, if that is how God clothes the grass, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown out in the fire, will he not much more clothe you? How do you have so little faith? How do we have so little faith that we trust ourselves more than we trust God? How is it that we have so little faith? Here's how. It's been stolen from us. It's been killed, it's been destroyed, it's been manipulated. And we've been sold this bill of goods that if I'll get up and it's on Sunday or in our dance Thursday night, right? Or or show up online, if I'll watch this little thing together, right? And if I'll do this spiritual calisthenics that somehow my life's gonna be full. And the truth is that this transfer of trust has to happen. We have to choose to believe that there's more for us, a full life that's so much bigger than empty religion could ever offer. And look what he says. He says, so don't worry by saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what should we wear? Look at how he says this. Pagans run after these things. I mean, he's not talking about pagans in some negative light. Like, they're, like he gets that these people are just separated from God and expressing their separatedness in a, in a unique way. But what he's saying is people who've been stolen from, people whose faith, people whose, whose full life has been kidnapped from them, they chase after stuff all the time. They're trying to figure out how to get their car fixed and how to get their life in order and how to get the kids to do this and how to do all that stuff. And you know what happens? Every time we move one thing forward, another one falls behind, doesn't it? Every time we get something in the right order, everything else falls out of the right order. And we wind up trying to push this whole thing, this wad we call life over the finish line. And most of us at some point or another, maybe raised our hand or walked an aisle, sat on a carpet square, right? And, and gave our life to Jesus. And then we're like, well, I kind of got ripped off because I didn't get a full life like I was promised. What I got was church. And I listen, I, I love church as much as the next guy, but I hate weekend in Maui beats it hands down, right? Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Showing up at church is great. I love it. It's fantastic. But this is not it. <laughs> this is not the whole story. God has so much more for it. Look at how he, how he finishes this. He says, the, the pagans run after these things. And I love, this is my favorite part. Could you just lean into this one thing? If you've tuned out and you're like making a grocery list or something, just tune back in for this one thing. And your heavenly father knows what you need. <laughs> he knows that you need those things. I, I love this part of the full life. I love this part about the transfer of trust. I love this part about my faith story. My heavenly father The God who spun existence, right? The God who said, you know what? I want stars to hang here and I want the sun to shine here and I want the earth to rotate on this axis. The God of heaven, right? This God who's do our wonder. That God knows what we need. Man, what do you need, right? What do you need right now? Are you looking and going, man, you know what? Like there's way more month than there is money. These gas prices are killing me. Your heavenly father knows that you need them. Some of you are going, man, I, I just don't know. I don't know if my relationship, my marriage is, uh, is a mess. Now, we don't always talk about it. And we, we don't do this stuff out and loud and in front of everybody else. But, but man, my, my relationship with my spouse is a mess. Your heavenly father knows they need them. Would transfer the trust, maybe? I mean, what is it that you need? Is it your business? And you're like, man, I've got all the ducks in a row and I got everything. It just doesn't seem to be working. Your heavenly father knows what you need. Are you struggling like in the housing market? It's insane, isn't it? I mean, it's absolutely nuts. Maybe you took advantage of the, like, I'm gonna dump this house while somebody else will take it for a minute. And then you're like, oh crap, I gotta buy a house. Sorry, I just said crap twice in the same sentence. Oh, that makes three times. <laughs> so here's the thing though, like that maybe you're going like through this and you're going, I, I don't know, man, I'm just terrified. I'm nervous. I don't know what to do. And you're worrying about it. What Jesus is telling us is to resign from the thing that we're most experted at, worrying about our life trying to figure out friendships. Your heavenly father knows. This is what the full life is about. It's this transfer of trust where I'm not saying I don't care about those things. I'm saying I'm transferring the trust of it, saying, God, I trust you with my life because you know more than I do. I love this where where he says this about them. He says, but seek first his kingdom and all his righteousness 
and all the things, the houses, the cars, the kids. Is that where you're worried? I mean, what's, what are you worrying about your kids? I get it. I mean, I get it. I have three girls, right? I mean, like it, it, it's an epic concern in my life to worry about. I have to worry about all the boys, right? You, it's not fun, you know? The three girls are 20, somebody's gonna have to help me, 22, 20, and 17. I worry about them a lot. Heavenly Father knows all the things that I need. And if I would just do this, if I would just say, God, I'm gonna seek first the kingdom of God. I'm gonna seek first his righteousness. I'm gonna, I'm gonna transfer trust. Look what happens to all the other things. They just fall in line. Not because they're magic and not because I'm silly or not because I'm, I'm just flippant about those things. And I want you to know something. If you're here tonight and faith, God, church, Jesus, the whole thing is arm's length for you. You're pushing back and you've got questions. I want you to know something. I know Suncrest. I know this church. I know these people. And this is a safe place for you to push back. This is a great place for you to belong, even before, or if you don't believe the same things everybody else around here believes. But here's the thing. I'm not saying that because I think that this religion thing fixes things. What I'm saying is that I can trust the God who spun the universe into existence. And as I've begun to trust him, this is a beginning thing for me. I'm not any more qualified to stand on this stage than anyone else in this room. As I'm beginning to transfer trust from my own worry of world, right? My own control to saying, God, I trust that you have something bigger. I want to tell you a quick story. It's in scripture. I, I love this story. And, and we kind of have a tendency to mess this one up. It's about this two ladies, right? Mary and Martha, they were sisters. And Mary and Martha um, were uniquely different, right? Like a lot of sisters are, like a lot of siblings are, like a lot of husbands and wives are. Like they're uniquely different personalities. But Jesus and his crew, the disciples and all the caravan of people were in town. And, and Martha comes up to them and says, listen, I want you to come over to the house. I want you to have a place to stay. I want, you to, I want to treat you well. I want to care about you. Martha has probably has the gift of hospitality. My wife has that gift. I don't have that gift. I'm, I'm like a bull in a china shop when it comes to people, right? Everything about me is blunt force trauma. My wife is the person who goes, hey, let's make sure that we vacuum and put chairs out and the, light candles and things smell good when she's around. It's really great to have Sheila around. She's a lot like Martha. I'm a little bit more like Mary. Mary, like, is, is she's real chill, right? Everybody's coming over. She's like, this is awesome. I, I love having a party. That's cool. What are we eating? You know, like that kind of thing. And Jesus and all the, all the people show up and, and Martha has been kind of working to get Now listen, here's the deal. We have a tendency in this story, if you're familiar with it, to give Martha a really hard time. But that's not what really happens here. You see, Martha is the linchpin in the whole story. If it wasn't for Martha, there would be no party right? If it wasn't for Martha, Jesus and all of them wouldn't have had an invitation. If it wasn't for Martha, they wouldn't have anywhere to sit. If it wasn't for Martha, they wouldn't have anything to eat. But there was this problem that Martha kind of got things out of order for a second. And it says this about, about Martha. It says um, that Mary and Martha were having trouble and they were kind of in this tense moment. And Martha's like, hey, listen, I, I've got this whole thing all organized. And my sister, Mary, is just sitting there, right? She's just hanging out with you guys. And I'm, I'm glad she likes to be with you. I like to be with you too, but I'm doing all the work and you're doing all the hanging out. You're doing all the enjoying. Jesus, would you tell Martha, would you tell Mary to come in and help me out? But Jesus says to this, it's like he says, uh, but the Lord says, Martha, Martha, Martha. I'm oh, sorry. Dear, my dear Martha. Some of you have seen the Brady Bunch and are worried and you are worried and upset over all these details. Don't these words always go together in our life? Worried and upset. Like, don't we have a tendency every time we worry about something, don't we have a tendency to get upset about it? And he says, you're worried and upset about all these details. He says, he says this, but the Lord said, uh, but he says, but few things are needed. Mary has chosen what is better. I'm not going to take it away from her. Now, this is what's so important for us. And this is kind of what we have to land the plane on. Cause I don't want to just talk in theory about stuff. The idea of religion is all buried in theory. It's all buried in concept. It's thinking and, and words and definitions and all these things. But if we don't put handles on it, if we don't put like ways to go live it out outside of this place, then it really is just literally empty and worthless. It's the same thing the, that Jesus accused the Pharisees of. He said that they were like whitewashed tombs. They were death on the inside, but they were 
painted nice on the outside, right? And that's the problem for us. If we don't put handles on this, he says, Mary has chosen what is better. You see what's going on? That our heavenly father knows what we need. And if we'll transfer trust, then we could have some of the full life. We could develop that portion of our life, pursuing God, his kingdom first above everything else. But we have to choose it. If you want to have a full life, you have to choose it. Now, I don't mean that like we chose it one time, right? I remember when I was seven years old, I was sitting on a carpet square and somebody said to me like, listen, if you don't give your life to Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And it sounded to me like they were getting the bus up to go today. So I'm like, I don't want to go to hell. Give me my hand up. Like, and you're like, that was, I don't want to do that, right? I'm not saying you have to choose it one time. You do have to choose it one time. I love the picture of baptism. It is such a fantastic, amazing, just image of what happens our old life is killed. Our old hopeless worry about our own stuff and we bury the old me and we raise an entire new me in picture to walk a brand new life. If you want a full life, you have to choose it. Not just once though. You have to choose it one day at a time. Once a minute if you have to, right? We have to choose to say, God, this transfer of trust, somehow I handed it over to you and I somehow I wanted it back in my hands again. Somehow I, I gave you that relationship problem that I've been having, and, and somehow here I am worrying about it again. So there's somehow, there's some part of it where I'm going, man, I'm worried about all the details, but I'm, I'm gonna trust you, God, because my heavenly Father knows everything that I need. So we have to set this idea into our minds that we're constantly gonna choose to say, I'm gonna seek first the kingdom of God. Not that I'm not gonna worry about the car and the house and the kids and the relationships and the money and, and the, all that stuff, right? Those things are important. But what I'm doing is trusting that God, the God who spun the universe into existence knows what I need and will give it to me. But here's the deal. We have to set the structure or set that direction in our minds with structure and spontaneity. I love the contrast of Mary and Martha's personalities. Mary, this chill, kind of leaning with Jesus, being there in the moment, just experiencing it, you know, and Martha doing all the work. Mary being me, right? I like to chill and just be, and be in it, right? And do the things. And my wife is so Martha, right? She's so detail-oriented and wonderfully organized. And she makes me, just, it just blows my mind how gifted she is. You know what we need to learn from each other? Is that we need to pursue God with both structure and spontaneity. There's a part of some of us who are like, yeah, I'm so type A, right? I'm driven, I get stuff done, I have an organizing. You're like, you're so frustrated with me because I've been 32 minutes and eight seconds right now. And you're going, all right, just give me the formula, man. Like, get it down. Is there not an ABC or a one, two, three? And I've got a blank that I missed and it's freaking you out, right? And I want you to know something. Maybe there's a part of you that needs to pursue some of this trusting God with our life with some spontaneity, some relaxed nature, some time alone with God. Not, I don't mean just the 15 minute block and the, I do my devotions or I read through the Bible in this many hours a week and do all the things. Those are great things and I'm not pushing back. Maybe we just need to carve out some time to listen and be with, and those words, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm the God who knows exactly what you need. But for those of us who are like me, who are like, I wasn't even paying attention, what'd you say? You know, like, like those of us who are a little more relaxed, a little more at ease with stuff, maybe you like to experience God on the road. I love nothing more than just happening across a station or asking it plays random songs and it plays them. And I, and I just got to meet this moment where I'm like, man, I'm totally into this and God, and I just kind of have this face-to-face -face conversation. I love that, right? I love time alone by myself just to, to be in the moment, right? I mean, I love being able to, to I, I'm a cigar smoker. So like, I love to chill out with my cigar and just, and just listen to what God has to say. But you know what I need? I need to apply a lot of structure to my life. I have to choose to say, listen, this isn't natural for me. I'm gonna to choose to, to set this direction in my life and choose it in my life, but I have to make a choice. I have to install structure that isn't natural for me, even in the least. 
These words of the psalmist are great. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. See what he doesn't do? As much as he contrasts Mary and Martha's personality, as much as our personalities might be different, he says, those who trust in the Lord, all of you, who trust first the kingdom of God and let all these other things be added to you, they lack no good thing. Maybe you're familiar with, uh, with, with the 23rd Psalm. I mean, I'm a preacher. I've used the 23rd Psalm a lot of times, usually when someone is horizontal, right? And I'm reading this, you'll get it later. But like when I'm reading this passage and it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The beginning of that passage says that I will not lack. That's beautiful. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. That's powerful. That's not what you're going to experience standing up and sitting down and singing songs. I love them, right? Probably one of my best friends on the planet. And I worked with him for two decades. I love his leadership. I love how he, how he embodies worship in his life. I think that's huge. But the truth of it is standing up and sitting down, listening to a guy talk for 30 minutes and going on about your life. It's never going to give you that life without lack. The only thing that can is to pursue first the kingdom of God in all of his righteousness. And all these things, all the stuff we're so worried about, if we'll pursue God, all those things will be added to us. Jesus' words again. Mary's chosen what is better. Mary's chosen to put me first. I'm not, I'm not taking it away from her. So much of our life is wrapped up in, in what is so is good, right? Our kids are good. Our house is good. I mean, our relationships, those are good things to worry about and care about and be concerned with. Who doesn't worry about what they eat or where they live or what they wear? It's part of who we are. But by choosing what is best over what is good, we attain what we can't lose. I just want to leave you with one word. Your heavenly father, this is it, knows what you need. I hope that this has been a meaningful experience for you, even online. And I want you to know that every time that we get together, both online and in person, we include a time of communion. This is a moment for people who follow Jesus to look back on life and remember with gratitude all the amazing things that God has done our need for God right now, and to look forward with hope, knowing that God is with us every step of the way. So now is the time to get some food and drink to represent Jesus's body and his blood that was broken and poured out for each and every one of us. And during that time, we're gonna reflect together. If you don't follow Jesus, that's totally okay. I'm glad that you're checking out this video. Go ahead and use this time to reflect on what you've heard so far. And with that, Let's focus on the love of Jesus together.
saw darkness run for cover But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over Registered in heaven Oh, my place Belongs here forever This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'll testify This is my testimony This is my testimony Before you turn off this video, go ahead and hit the like, subscribe, and share button. And I want you to know that this video, this isn't the church, you are. So this week, I hope that you go and make a difference, that you go and be the church.